escape from his grinding city job in London 17 years ago, and how he's pursuing his dream of living life as simply and as self-sufficiently as possible. Toby's two male turkeys are his pride and joy. Are they for Christmas, Toby? <laughs> no, no, they're, they're, they're sort of more like pets, really. I've got, I've got some, um, uh, some hens coming to, uh, to, to breed them. And then the offspring of those will be for Christmas, yeah. So um, I, think, I think they think I'm a female. They're displaying at me. <laughs> I know I'm ugly, but I didn't think I was that ugly. Toby's ordered two female turkeys to give his lonely males some much-needed company. And he's hoping to collect them on his forthcoming trip to the mainland for the launch of his book. On St Agnes, David's big church gathering is drawing to an end. I'd like to invite you to all of you to come out to the front with your stone and place it in a pile here at the front. These are a sign of your prayers, but also a sign of your story. Those times you have come through stormy, difficult waters. And when people come into the church this week, they will say, I wonder what those stones are for. And someone, I hope, will be able to tell them the story. For the minister, it's been a particularly poignant service. But I'd just like to um, place one more stone on here, and if you don't mind me um, bringing a personal note in here, I think this might be a, <coughs> a stone for my father who died last October, and it's a stone for him because he helped to tell me the story. This morning, Toby's on his way to a rare trip to the mainland. He's managed to persuade the famous Eden Project in the heart of Cornwall to host the launch of his book. It's the climax to years of hard work. There's a lot of, a lot of emotion that's, that's got us to this point, really. And, and to be really honest, when, when the book was delivered to me about three days ago, yeah, I sat down with a glass of wine in front of me and had a bit of a cry for a minute or two. So, uh, Paul is there too, looking uncharacteristically dapper for the big occasion. A lot hangs on the next hour or two. Toby's desperate to impress the local journalists and PR people who've been invited to the launch. Early morning sunlight over the islands. And already a few keen swimmers are down on the beach. And with the weather set fair, down in the harbour, plans for a day's fishing are already being discussed. These aren't the Isles of Scilly. In fact, they're almost exactly on the other side of the planet, as far from Scilly as it's physically possible to be. This is Rarotonga, the largest of the Cook Islands in the middle of the South Pacific. And surprisingly, the similarities with Scilly are striking. As well as the fabulous beaches, there's one tiny radio station. <laughs> and just one town. The islands are self-governing. The Queen is the head of state. There's one airport, one main harbour. And like Scilly, everything the islanders need comes in on one supply ship. But unlike the daily trips of the Salonian, it takes nine days for the Southern Express to get to and from the nearest mainland, New Zealand. They won't be seeing her again for another three weeks. And as on Scilly, there's also just one vet surgery. Here, volunteer vets and nurses, many from England, work long hours caring for the island's animal population and particularly the huge number of wild cats and dogs. They've recently been joined by a familiar face from the Isles of Scilly. When she left the surgery on St Mary's, Heike's veterinary nurse, Sara, flew straight here for a long-standing two-month tour of duty. This cat's got fish poisoning, which is quite common in the Cook Islands. It's a thing called ataxia. It's a complete and utter uncoordination of the limbs. He should go completely back to normal at some point, but 
it does take a while for that toxin to work out through the body. And how's this little chap getting on? Do he's doing really well and he's really friendly. He likes having his belly tickled. What, what made you want to, to come across the planet like this and, and work in a place like this? Well, I've always wanted to travel. The first book I ever picked up when I was a child was an atlas. And as a vet nurse, you're qualified to work in any country in the world. And the Worldwide Veterinary Service listed this charity in the South Pacific. So I just wrote to them, asked them if they'd like a vet nurse, and they said, yes, please. So you really put your, your heart into this? Because you're not getting yeah. paid again, are you? No. <laughs> no. Are, are you missing silly? I am a little bit, yeah. It, it's really funny how here you can go climb a mountain and be in tropical rainforest and look out over the ocean. And at some point, it's the same ocean that you're looking out over when you go stand at the lighthouse up on the point kind of on St Mary's as well, which is really odd, but it's really nice. So and you feel a connection between yeah, the two islands? Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities between the two island communities. Dear Heike, how are you? Life here on the island is pretty idyllic at times, although when it's really rainy and windy, it's just like being on St Mary's. The work at the clinic is interesting. So interesting, in fact, that I'm applying to vet school to learn to be a vet. I know I swore I'd never do this. But being here has made me realize how much more I could do and how much more I want to know. Would you be a reference for me? I'd really appreciate it. Sarah seems to be happy down there, doesn't she? Are you pleased? It's lovely. She really liked the job and uh, she liked it so much that she wants to be a vet now. Would she make a good vet, do you reckon? She does her thing well. She's a good nurse. So I think she'll be a good vet too. The key question is, is she going to come back to Silly? I don't know, but I hope. I would hope that she would come back. <laughs> oh, please! Sarah hoped that the long hours and big workload in the Cook Islands would help prevent her feeling too isolated and cut off from the outside world. Although, as it turns out, she's not anything like as lonely as she could have been. Down the road from the surgery in the local market, there's another familiar face from the Isles of Scilly. Far from heading off to be a Buddhist monk in Sri Lanka, at the last minute, Greg has headed 12,000 miles in completely the opposite direction. <laughs> Back at the Eden Project in the heart of Cornwall, Toby's book signing session's well underway. But then things start to go badly awry. <laughs> Toby had arranged to take delivery of the turkey hens he needs to take home to St. Martin's after the book launch was over. But there seems to be a slight misunderstanding with the Cornish breeder he's bought them from. Oh, oh lovely. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> lovely, yeah. How about that? Oh, oh cute. they're beauties, aren't they? <laughs> Toby's putting a brave face on it, but the timing couldn't be worse. <laughs> it's quite a stir, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, the book launch seems to have taken second place, then. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There he is. Tell him to smile. Suddenly, the two turkey hens are upstaging the budding authors at their publishing debut. <laughs> After the launch, the turkeys join Toby on the long journey to England's remotest community. Despite having had his book launch spoilt, Toby's at least hoping for a much tastier Christmas ahead. Here you go, girls. Welcome to St. Martin's. Whoa! <laughs> After much speculation, there's some firm news at last about the Silly Boys rowers. The project manager for the row, Ginger Jim, has managed to speak to the boys on the oil tanker that rescued them. Well, the boat is now heading towards Gibraltar and it's due to dock about midnight on, on Saturday, early Sunday. Um, 
we managed to get all the paperwork sorted now because the boys lost their passports. So they lost everything, didn't they? They did, yes. I mean, priority was life. Um, and so um, they forgot all about all their personal effects. And some of those got, did, in fact, get washed away in the sea. When are they coming back? Uh, well, I've managed to get the tickets and they were hoping to be on the boat on Tuesday. On the Salonian ferry? Yes. It's going to be quite a moment, isn't it? I think it'd be very emotional. I mean, it's sort of mixed emotions, I guess, for most people. Yes, and it's difficult to know how to play this one, um, but it'll be great for the boys to see their families again and their loved ones. I think that's just tremendous. Over on the other side of the world, and it's another busy day at Rarotonga's veterinary surgery. Today, Sarah's trying to coax down one of her new admissions from the top of an enormous coconut tree. This has happened to many of your patients, Sarah. I have to admit, this is the first one it's happened to. <laughs> it's the first time we've lost a cat to a coconut tree. So is the fire brigade on its way? I'm just about to call them now to get them to come down. <laughs> Also doing voluntary work here alongside Sarah is none other than Greg, the son of Nigel from the Air Fair Cafe. This one we think it has a kidney problem, it's not eating or drinking, but it wasn't when it was... He shows visitors around the surgery. He's also been put in charge of all the admin and paperwork. Greg, last time I saw you, you were on the Isles of City heading off to be a, a Buddhist monk. What's happened? Um, I've... I went to England and I, I stayed in a little hermitage for a weekend and just kind of had the time to think about a few things. And I have come to understand that Buddhism is just not my path. So what brings you here? Um, Sarah brings me here, actually, I guess. That's the, the main reason why I'm here. I'm... What is it about Sarah that, that made you change path like that? Then? <laughs> I don't, like... I guess she, she was just attract. I was attracted to her. She's very pretty. She's a pretty girl. <laughs> yeah, and like my Carol and my dad, they, they both thought she was pretty. <laughs> she was, they were wondering why I didn't act sooner. <laughs> Is that <laughs> like, what they said to you? Yeah. Well, your they they, dad they, said they that. didn't think it was surprising. <laughs> Did your dad say, why didn't you make a move quicker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Saved by the bell. That's the honey, Greg speaking. Greg is not a great one for keeping in touch. Friday? Back home on Scilly, up at the Airfare Cafe, Nigel is desperate for information on how things are going between his son and Sarah. As far as I know, he's got there safely. I haven't heard because he doesn't talk on the phone very much. <laughs> okay, no news probably means good news. Uh, well, exactly, right. yes. I think I'd have heard. And we have said to Sarah that she's got to be the one that keeps in touch with us because Greg never will. And we've got her mobile. Greg, of course, doesn't have a mobile. Um, so in a week or so's time, if I still haven't heard, I'll give her a ring and uh, hopefully hear something. I think she's fairly well organised, which is what Greg needs more than anything, because he's totally not. He, he's a drifter. Is she good for him? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think together they'll be very good. Uh, but I don't want to say how far involved or whatever they are, because I, I don't know. But there must be something there for him to follow around the world. <laughs> Greg and Sarah are not only working together, they've also set up home together. It's all happening very fast. It is amazing the randomness of life, isn't it? The fact that you both just happened to meet on Silly and yeah. you were both going in totally different directions. Now here you are together. It's good. I mean, I wasn't even supposed to be in England in kind of June. I was supposed to be here in June, you know. I was supposed to leave in February, and because of previous events, I'd put off leaving. And the hours of silly only came up through kind of random things, and I guess you only kind of decided to get in contact with your dad at a certain point. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's, it's random, but it's, it's good. Who made the first move, then? I don't know. Probably me. I'm the gobby one, so probably me. <laughs> I think Greg's the more kind of takes a step back and thinks about everything before either acting or, or saying anything. On, and I'm a bit more kind of... I, I, I think we balance each other out a bit. So you're well suited? I think so. 
I think we'd have to be to be on the other side of the world together and to one of us not have flown home already because yeah. it's been pretty high pressure to work together, live together. You're looking pretty good on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sunshine, good food, <laughs> happiness. <laughs> now there are some big decisions to be made for Greg and Sarah. Do they have a long-term future together? And if so, is it on the Cook Islands or 12,000 miles east on the Isles of Scilly? Back on the other side of the world, and it's the beginning of the last week of June. There's a slight southerly breeze. And just like so many June mornings on Scilly this year, rain is forecast for later in the day. But in one respect, today's quite unlike any other. The four Silly Boys rowers are at last due home on the Silonian after their ordeal in the North Atlantic. Friends and family gather on the end of the quay, there's a sense of unease. Nobody really knows what to expect. The islanders have no real idea what state the four rowers are in, and they've no idea what kind of a reception lies in store. A sudden round of applause breaks the tension. Get back to find out what normal is again. Getting the grips is actually sort of being at home properly. I'm sure sort of it'll take a couple hours or days or weeks to sink in, but it's nice to be back. Oh, good Welcome home, Chip. Really, really pleased to see you back, safe and well. You're our silly heroes, and always will be. We need to be here for them. I mean, you can't actually do anything. You can't snap your fingers to make it all unhappen, as it were. But you can just be there for people, and I think that's what the community is about, and all the people who are here today. We're saying we want to be alongside them and to support them, give them their space, yes, but to, just to be there and know that we love and we, we care for them. And again, I can't say this too often, to say thank you that they're in one piece. They could so easily just be lost somewhere. They're all going down the pond now. You come in. I may do, yes. Good Methodist teetotaler. <laughs> in a sense, the long-awaited return of the Silly Boys is the end of one story. But it also marks the start of quite another. Adjusting back to normal life on the islands and reassessing their futures in the light of the brush with death they've all had may not be quite as straightforward as some had hoped. In the next programme, after three lonely years living on Scilly, Heike de Vette is looking for love. 
I want to go out more. I'm open, I'm friendly. It's easy to talk with me, but I would like to talk about something else sometimes, apart from sick animals. And sometimes you think, well, I haven't really gone for that beautiful walk for ages. I live here. And the run-up so to the election, here. which will decide the Reverend David's whole future on Silly Begins, bringing with it a colourful character will play a key role in the proceedings. Well, it's up to them. It's up to the people on the sillies. I, I'm, I'll chair the meeting, but it, they, they'll have to make the decision. Will Clarence be coming with you? I'd be delighted! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Clarence. I'll have to see if I've got your passport. I've got it somewhere. Oh, all right, then. <laughs>